Many thanks for choosing us. Uh, let's begin with students at the University of Ghana who are in a state of confusion as they hear their lecturers will continue with their sit-down strike. At the heart of their concerns is the disruptions to academic activities, particularly lectures and their project work. They are, however, appealing to government and management to step to salvage the situation. My colleague Michael Ashali was there earlier today interacting with some students. Anna. Um, particularly at the James, uh, Jones Corte building, JQB, arguably the most um, popular and the biggest of the lecture halls at the University of Ghana. Ordinarily, you'd have hundreds of students um, going up and down the flight of stairs behind me, going into the over five lecture halls that we have here. Um, the reason is simple. The lecturers have decided uh, to continue to stay on their industrial action and not return to the classrooms here. The, Biggest of the people who are being impacted are the students, and I'll talk to um, a couple of them here. Um, I have Ellie. Now, Ellie, so quickly, tell me, how is this impacting you? This is supposed to be the second day since classes should have started, but that's not the case. As a student, how are you bearing the brunt of it? Well, Rani, at the moment, uh, what I can say to you is that uh, it's unfortunate because as I'm speaking to you right now, I'm supposed to be taking a geochemistry class uh, together with an ignorance of Africa class right, right now. But uh, I went to the class and uh, the lecturer is not in. And you know that as we are getting, the information we are getting is that Utah is on strike and the department is saying until they are back, uh, nothing can be done about it. So it's unfortunate to us at this moment. And we are going to see in the coming days more uh, disruption to the academic calendar. At the time, the, the management of the university is trying its best to revert to the August uh, starting date for every academic semester. So I think this time, government should try its best to be resolving the matter instead of ordering the teachers to go back to the classroom. So that, that's Eli, um, a level 400 student, who says, well, he's really um, struggling um, to get that. So I have Mumuni here. Mumuni, uh, level 100 or 400? 200. Level 200, OK. So I mean, what class should you have by now? And what, what, and it hasn't happened. How is that affecting? Uh, that is sociology class. And he one day, and the lecturer is not there. And I think uh, this week, we're supposed to be learning a lot. While they, they are still on strike, and we don't know when they are going to call it off, I think we'll be lacking very behind. So. Uh, we are pleading on behalf of the government to, I mean, do something about it so that they will resolve the issue and the lecturers will return back for us to learn. Otherwise, if you're not a serious student, you are going to lag far behind because we need to be reading on our own. And we know that not all the students are willing to learn if the lectures are not around. So that is what... So you mentioned that you went to the class. Uh, when you went to the class, were you given an official communique that the class was cancelled? Oh, yesterday, I think, yesterday there was a meeting between the UTAG and then the government, and what came out was that uh, they are not going to call off the strike yet until further notice, so we don't know. We are still waiting patiently for them to return so that we can start our lectures. Okay. So that, that's Mumuni, level 200 student. He says that he's also bearing the brunt of his lecturer's decision to continue to stay on strike. Um, Nicholas. Uh, how about you? How is this really difficult for you as a student? So f for me, um, my, when I was coming this semester, I had a lot of plans. And looking at the way the semester is going, it doesn't look like all the plans will come to pass. And most of us feel aimless, kind of, because you are going, coming back. You don't know what you are doing. I checked my timetable. They told us that, oh, the timetable, it will change probably if the lectures resume. So we shouldn't really pay attention to that. So it's like we are just in the school. We are not really doing anything. So yes. Some of the concern for some of the students is the academic calendar in this. I mean, what's your major concern about it? What about the academic calendar? We are, we are resuming to what used to be our main calendar where all the, the levels were in school, but this time the UTAG strike has come in. So it breaking would be a very big blow because we would have to reschedule, change other things to still come back to the uh, full um, level 100 to 400 again. So I think, yeah, that's not what we want this at this time. Uh, by the way, what level are you in? I'm in level 300. Level 300. So let me go back to Eli, who is the final year. So he's mentioned that he has um, a project. So uh, you have fears already that if this continues, that we is going to prolong. You're hoping to graduate very soon. I mean, how, how disturbing is that to you? Uh, yeah. Ordinarily, this should be worrying to all of us because at this moment, I'm supposed to processing my data. 
I'm done with the field working stuff, but at the moment, it's supposed to be taught the practical laboratory side of the course to be able to process your samples and get the details and be able to put up an article online. But at the moment, the lecturers, what they can tell you this morning, what my supervisor can tell me is that he's on strike and why are you worrying him? Are you worrying his life? So you're supposed to just have, have a time so when they return back to, to the classroom, they will be able to process. Let, let me ask you that. Have you had any official committee from any of your lecturers that are taking their course this semester? on what is going to happen um, in yesterday and today, no class. A any communication from them? Generally, the department is not saying anything, but individually, some of the lecturers are saying that some of the, they've uploaded materials on the Sakai LMS uh, for students to just take advantage of the time and be reading uh, in the meantime. But other lecturers, they are just not con concerned about the whole situation. They are saying that until they return back to the classroom, they are not going to do anything. Let, let me take finally. So I heard you say something about a loading of courses onto Sakai, the LMS platform, the online platform of teaching and learning. Um, did you go there and is it true that some of the ledgers have done that? They've done that, they've uploaded some of the materials and they actually say that, okay, you can do that. But largely, just, just one out of uh, seven courses I'm taking this semester, just one lecturer was able to do that. But largely, the six lecturers, they are just unconcerned about it. So, those are some of the frustrated students here. Uh, let me take a final word. So, what do you want to happen at the moment for you? Uh, right now, what I want to happen at the moment is I want the government and then, then the teachers to I mean, do something about the strike so that they will call it off for them to return back to campus so that we will start or we will begin our lectures. So you just heard from some concerned students at the University of Ghana. Uh, you can see behind me some others have taken the initiative on their own to try and study, possibly do some uh, um, brushing through the notes. You mentioned that some of them have been given the slides, some course materials. So that's the situation here at the University of Ghana. This is JQB. Arguably, a lot more students should be here than we see today, but that's not the case. Reporting for Joy News, um, this is Michael Papani Ashale from JQB. Let's do more education because the Ghana Education Service says it will be meeting with stakeholders to consider the proposed introduction of the semester system in basic schools. Uh, this is in response to the fierce resistance from stakeholders in the sector towards the new GES policy. The unions in education on Monday issued a statement bemoaning the GES a lack of consultation among the various stakeholders. The Ghana National Association of Teachers not believes the policy is dead on arrival and blames the GES for violating a collective agreement between them. Thomas Musa is General Secretary of NAT. At the basic level, we teach. We don't lecture. And if you look at UNICEF's own concept of teaching and learning, they have what we call learning through play. Right. And so... Th that is for those at the very basic yes, level, those, kindergarten. And kindergarten. All. You don't go and lecture somebody at KG level. You don't lecture him. Mm. You learn through what we call play. Right. You learn through, it is an activity oriented. Mm. So for example, when the teacher goes to the KG or class one or class two to teach, you start with something like my head, my shoulders, my knees, my toes, my head, my shoulders. These are not things you can lecture. These are things that you, the teacher, will have to do and you do it with them. And it is, I mean, it is an activity oriented. You learn through play for six good hours. Look. By the time, if you start with the children with this particular activity oriented, don't forget that we are now doing the standard based curriculum. Right. And the standard, with the standard based curriculum, the principle there is that it is the child centered learning. Mm. And so, once it is the child centered learning and it is internationally being accepted, and UNICEF is even promoting it now, children must learn through play and all those things. By 12 o'clock, the KG children, they would have been tired. And you see them sleeping in the class. Right. And all that. And aside that one, you are asking the children to stay in school from January to somewhere June. What's that? I, since 1989, that I did my national service at 28 February Girls Road Primary School, and went to St. Thomas, to go and teach at the JHS and from there to the training college. I have not done any other work than teaching. I have taught at the uh, KG level. I have taught at the primary level, taught at the JHS, and I've been a head teacher before. Mm. This semester... Is, is, is this the first time you're seeing anything like this? Um, see, I am, see, I am, um, so I'm explaining this for people to know that I am speaking from a professional point of view, mm. and I am speaking as a practitioner. 
I have been in the system since 1989. Mm. You can calculate the number of years I have been in the teaching profession. And so, this particular thing that we are saying, it is death on arrival. It is death dangerous. Yes, it's it is dangerous. Mm. You to introduce a semester system at the KG level, it is dangerous. Member on Parliament's Education Committee, uh, Peter Nochukoto, wants the Ministry of Education and Ghana Education Service to withdraw the policy. He describes it as professionally wrong. He's also been speaking on the AM show. So, if uh, one teacher is going to handle a, a class from uh, as you mean, 7 30 to 3 30, how does you get work? How, how does you get home and prepare for the next day? Marking of exercises and uh, the preparation of a lesson notes. So I think some of these things, the ministry failed in uh, taking them into consideration. Then, again, the number of weeks. I know at the tertiary level, I don't know if it has changed now, but it is 16 weeks that we do for a semester. Right. And we want a basic school to run 20 weeks of a semester. How come? So in the year, it's going to be 40 weeks. But when we're practicing the semester, we were able to do about 42 weeks in a term. You see, from January to March or early April, they break. Then they come back in May. By July, August, they break. Then September, they go. By middle of December, they break. So that the child, both the child or the learner and the teacher can have time to rest. You see, so to me, this arrangement has, uh, as the other members, has already died on arrival. The ministry must withdraw it. It is professionally wrong for on their part. And... Uh, in fact, it is not workable to me. Yeah. So, so this is completely unworkable. Completely yeah. unworkable. Yeah, it is not workable. And, and it's something that, uh, as ranking member of, of the Education Committee, that, that, that's the stance you're going to adopt. Is, is that the stance of, of not just you, but yeah. your caucus in Parliament? I mean, I know you are not, Parliament is yet to reconvene, but the thoughts you've been sharing with your colleague MPs, are you on the same page in, in respect to yes. this? Yes. Oh, yeah. We're all on the same page. You see... If you look at uh, even the environment in which uh, our teachers and then the students do the teaching and learning, that, you will realize that we don't have the adequate infrastructure. If you look at uh, the environment in which the teaching and learning activities take place, mm. you will discover that we don't even have the appropriate uh, uh, furniture. In some communities, learners or children have to carry home or carry to school to the uh, kids to, to go and sit and learn. And they are going to sit uncomfortable for these hours. So it's not proper. The classrooms, some of them are poorly ventilated. Mm. So if you want to keep the child in that environment for a very long time, you are endangering uh, his or her health. In response to the resistance by the stakeholders, the GES says it will be doing further consultations on the matter. Cassandra Chum speaks for the service. Say that we had even reduced them because usually they had, um, we had 40, 42 weeks and um, the committee that met rather reduced to 40 weeks and then we had to split for each semester 2020. Of course, there is one month vacation within um, each of the 20 weeks and then we have um, holidays, we have weekends and all of that. And that has been the case. Even when we're doing the trimester, we had um, sometimes 12 weeks, 14, maybe 14. And then it's just that because we, they are aligning to the junior high school semester and the senior high school semester, it appears as if they are going to school for a longer period. But we have rather, I mean, cumulatively reduced from the 42 to rather 40. 40 weeks, and yeah. then we uh, encourage our parents and everybody to um, bear with us, and definitely would, it's the best that we want for our kids. Now, there's also been a conversation going on about withdrawing the policy. Is this something you're considering? Um, we always invite discussions and everything. We can't do it alone. I mean, in educating these kids, it's, it's holistic, and so whatever decisions or discussions or suggestions that are coming around. Definitely we'll look at it on the table, um, mm -hmm. but I can't say for a fact now that we would consider rescinding the decision or not. That would be, uh, that's a policy issue and will come from the ministry. But definitely I know the minister and my board, the director general, Professor Peso Kupamamba, will definitely have a look at it. And then we welcome all opinions because it's for the best of the country.
Welcome back to The Pulse. If you just joined, you can uh, join us uh, via all our social media handles. It's on Joy News on TV. You can tweet at us with the hashtag The Pulse. Now, President Ekofuadu uh, completes his leadership of the NPP when his two-year term of office in 2024. Uh, before this time, his successor should have been selected by the party's members at Congress. The race continues to take shape as the days go by, with Trade Minister Alan Sherman Singh and Vice President Dr. Mamadou Baumia, uh, the front runners for the job. While the two men have directly not voiced out their desire for the job, they have not been able to hide it from the public either, with their supporters conducting underground campaigns. It is now the anger of some of the supporters which has given rise to concerns that the contest may not be fair. Is that indeed the case? This afternoon we have brought together experts and party supporters to discuss the push for NPP leadership and what will be required to conduct a smooth process that also energizes the party's grassroots for victory in the next elections. Let's start with some of the concerns. Since the release of the rules and regulations, a number of high-profile and ranking members of the party have openly violated the rules and regulations by declaring their support for the Vice President, His Excellency Dr. Alaji Mahmoud Baumia, who has left nobody in doubt of his ambition to become the party's presidential candidate. Prominent among these party officials who have blatantly violated the party's rules and regulations are as follows. Deputy General Secretary of the Party, Nana Obri Bwahi, the Northern Regional Executives led by Chairman Samba, the Vice Chairman of Ashanti, Mr. Kobra Senchire, the Member of Parliament for Karaga, my own friend and former colleague, Amin Anta, and then Member of Parliament for Toron, Honorable Habib Idrisu, and Farouk Mahama, MP for Yendi, among others. Interestingly, even though the actions of the above mentioned officials and senior members clearly violate the party's code of conduct, none of these blatant violators has been called to order by the national executives of the party. The worst of it all, at the recent national delegate conference of the party, which was held in Kumasi, no less a person than the vice president himself, Alaji Dr. Mahmoud Mamia who was part of the very body that promulgated the party's rules and regulations in wanton disregard of the same rules and regulations arrived at the conference ground with supporters wearing his branded t-shirts and banners announcing his campaign for the flag bearership. As if breaching the code of conduct wasn't embarrassing, the vice president and his cohort in their Desperation went on as far as breaching the state protocols as he and his followers arrived late to the function. Well ahead, well after His Excellency, the President, Anado Dankwa Ekufado, and the First Lady had taken their seats. In spite of all this embarrassing conduct, nobody in the national executive, including Mr. John Bodu, the General Secretary, who announced the sanctions has come out to condemn it or say anything about it. However, in an animal farm selective justice fashion, when supporters of other aspirants, particularly Honorable Alan John Kujo Martin, a founding member of the party, tried to stand their ground and protect their own, they are either immediately rounded up by security agencies or subjected to acts of intimidation and senseless suspension. A clear case in point is the arrest and detention of some supporters of Honorable Alan Chamatin, the Minister for Trade and Industry, and a leading contender to the flag bearership at the just-ended National Delegate Conference for protesting the flagrant abuse of the party's regulations. Things are really falling apart in MPP of today. Our fear, ladies and gentlemen, is that if current situation is not arrested and every member of the party made to feel an equal member with equal opportunities, 
the party would face an ignominious defeat in 2004 with grave consequences into the future. We want to use this medium to appeal to His Excellency Nana Dodankwe Kufuado, His Excellency J. Kufo, the former president, and other leading personalities, including Mr. Kojo Pienin Osafu Mafo. As disappointing as it may sound, the three people, namely Abdul Rahman Dauda, Khalib, and Mustafa, who have been punished by way of suspension for allegedly supporting Honorable Alan Shermatin, were never taken through the above stipulated procedures as issued by the party on July 27, 2021. To the astonishment of the party grassroots, ladies and gentlemen, Alaji Mohammed Bantima. Samba, Honorable Habib Idrisu, Honorable Farouk Mohammed, Honorable Amin Anta, and lawyer Nana Obri Boye have, uh, not forgetting Kwabna Sentry, have all breached the party's code of conduct with impunity. But the party's top hierarchy has kept mute, surprisingly. That we find so worrying and raising much suspicion going forward. Abundant evidence available gives a clear verdict that the party's application of the code of conduct issued by the national executives have, prove, uh, have proven beyond reasonable doubt to be selective and abusive. Let's now broaden the conversation and speak with Christian Daniel Dugan, who is former Deputy Minister for Fisheries under the Kofor administration. Dr. Asasante is Senior Lecturer, Political Science Department and Director of the Center for European Studies at the University of Ghana. I'm also joined by Eric Osei, who is convener of the Ashanti Patriots Movement. Dr. Kobi Mensah is a political communication strategist with the University of Ghana Business School. And Dr. Ali Dusaido is also a senior lecturer at the Department of Political and uh, Political Science Department at the University of Ghana. I'm extremely grateful, gentlemen, for your time uh, this afternoon. I want to start with an article that has been widely circulated, written by a member of the MPP, George Krobi Asante, except which reads, the party's disappointing performance in the 2020 general elections, which culminated in the loss of our parliamentary majority status, is ample proof that all is not well with our dear party. How does the current happenings in the NPP come across to you? Uh, Dr. Sassanti, I'll start with you. Good afternoon, Aisha, and good afternoon to your viewers. Um, I think he has hit the nail right on the head. The last election, even though MPP won, they struggled to do so. Because if you look at it from previous elections, you realize that that was a difficult one because of a lot of factors. But um, we are surprised uh, as to the turn of events now. Because if you look at even this government, which is a little, um, is about more than one year now, uh, the government is uh, having a lot of challenges. One would have expected the party to be united at this time to be able to forge ahead, work, and uh, support the party to champion its cause. But of course, this concerns also um, is an ample testimony uh, that uh, there are a lot that the party need to do in order to make sure that they place themselves in the right uh, position to fight the battle of 2024. Um, it is very, very uh, difficult task for them now, but they need to be able to uh, look at the best way to handle it so that people don't feel pain, so that people don't feel isolated within a party that they call their own, that they want to be associated with all the time. So it's a whole gamut of um, issues that they need to handle and handle it carefully. Now, uh, Dr. Ali Risaidu, what's your own reading of the current situation uh, in the NPP? Dr. Ali Risaidu? All right, so if we don't uh, have... Thank you, Aisha. I think there have been a lot of uh, accusations and counter-accusations uh, about the level of fair playing fold that has been given to potential aspirants that want to succeed 
the president as flag bearer in the 2024 elections. Mm. And I think all the press conferences that we have listened to have been able to cite concrete examples to back the claims that they are making. And I think the last time the party reacted to it was, I think yesterday, when the general secretary spoke to one of the press conferences. And I think he didn't dispute the fact that these things has actually happened and the people who have been punished have been supporting one of the potential flag bearers and not the other. What he just said was that the party's laws will be strictly applied. And I think we, they have to move beyond just words to be able to put this into action. To be honest with you, victory is seriously a requirement for the success of the MPP in 2024. And like my colleague, uh, Dr. Asante mentioned, even with a united front and being in government, last year was a, a struggling victory for the MPP. So if the party is not able to maintain that unity and move into 2024, it's going to be very difficult for them. And the NPP must be guided by history. They have lost elections that they were supposed to win simply because of disagreement and the lack of unity. So moving forward, the level at which internal democracy is dipping in this country, the national democratic dispensation and consolidation. So I think if you are not able to put your house into order, you don't have the right to speak to national issues when the same rules are applied to you as a political party uh, in the major election. So I think appropriate steps must be taken in a reassuring manner to let everybody know that an equal playing field will be, will be provided for all potential uh, flag bearers who want to, potential flag bearers who want to uh, uh, succeed the president so that they will have a very free, fair, transparent, democratic process. And that can build unity in the party and rally all the other candidates behind the winning candidate so that 2024 will be a very solid, uh, comprehensive, holistic campaign structure for the MPP. Uh, Dr. Kobe Mensa, what does this mean in terms of branding and marketing, I mean, uh, for MPP 2024? Thank you, Aisha, and uh, hello to my colleagues. Um, uh, obviously, that is a very terrible situation to be in, especially coming from a, a party that is known as a due process you know, party. And uh, we just recently published a paper uh, that actually looked at you know, uh, the relationships you know, within political parties. Internal wranglings is one of the key issues that actually happen to political parties all over the world. But that is one of the key issues that actually take parties to a position. I mean, obviously corruption, <laughs> next is uh, unfulfilled promises, and next is open lines. But one of the key things is internal wranglings actually sent a lot of political parties from government to a position. So clearly it is something that is a dent on a party that claims due process because clearly people are actually saying that that due process is not happening. You seem to be, you know, cracking the whip, you know, on one side, but not the other. And the party's response, as uh, Dr. Ali Dusedi actually mentioned, you know, wasn't that enough to prove that indeed they have been fair in the, in the, in the approach that they are taking. So it's a very serious case for the MPP. Uh, and then of course they should understand that agency, you know, uh, theory actually happens in political parties. You can actually argue that, yes, uh, the vice president hasn't actually declared that he wants to contest. You can argue that, you know, uh, Honorable Alan Chomantin hasn't actually declared that he's contested. You can argue that Boache Jack hadn't declared. But of course, agency, you know, you have the agents, you know, uh, coming out and then demonstrating that indeed the intent. And the vice president hadn't actually you know, disproved it. He, he had actually gone on to put up action that suggests that indeed he's contested. Have you taken any action against his supporters or him? No. Of course, you have actually taken action against, you know, Honorable Alan Chamantin's, you know, supporters. So I think that is very, very difficult, you know, to understand. And I'm sure the voters are actually looking at it and they're thinking, well, this is a party that calls itself due process political party. Uh, thankfully, I have two members of the NPP on this uh, panel for the conversation. Uh, Mr. Dugan is a former deputy minister under the Kofa administration. Mr. Dugan, you are a member of the NPP. Are you worried about the recent developments? Yeah, I'm very, very worried. Terribly worried because um, if you belong to a party, that is your all 
you are born into that tradition and you want to see the party progress, no matter what position you are giving the party, you just want the party to progress because our tradition is a kind of tradition which I believe, given the chance, we can transform this country. But however, if we have this kind of things going on, where there's a selective justice, where there's a something called something I call elitism. And when I say elitism here, I'm not saying that um, it's wrong being an elite, but elitism in the sense that uh, what they call it, uh, exclusiveness and snobbishness, that is being exhibited by some members of the party, especially the national executive. Then there's cause to worry. The cause to worry centers on the fact that the United Gold Coast Convention, UGCC, was formed in 1947, I believe. But by 1952, it was disbanded because of elect, uh, electism. You know, the, the, the top hierarchy of the party were not regarding the youth and, uh, and the commoners. And they all moved with Nkrumah into the CPP. Now you see, rules have been set. And I heard the, the honorable um, the professor also saying that this party is known to adhere to rule of law. This is our kind of democracy. Now when you set the rules and they look one way, whilst other people are flouting that rule or the rules, but then you tend to suspend or punish others when they also flaunt the rules. Then you are creating problems for the party. Now, may I continue? And um, I'm so sad about the way the General Secretary, John Buedo, is uh, doing his things. He set the rules, but then he made a statement that Umuni Bohemia, Bohemia's father, was key in the formation and the history of the United Party. This is a big lie. He shouldn't have even mentioned Bamiya's name, uh, Mumuni Bamiya's name. Then a lady from the Jubilee House called Teresa at a public function introduced Bamiya as the incoming president. Nothing was done to her. Honorable Habib Ijusu, uh, Toron, and uh, Honorable Omar Ali Mahama openly campaign for Baumia, nothing has been done. John Buedu came, I think yesterday or the day before yesterday, to say that the leader of the Ashanti region group, which spoke against selective justice, was not an MPP member. Well, he was an MPP member, gave up his membership card and stood independent. Okay, so we should go to sleep. No, and what about those who held the same press conference in the North and in Cape Coast? In fact, the spokesperson for the crypto group was a former DC, Samuel Yao Ajay Kesi. Uh, Ajay B. Kesi, sorry. Now, we, we have, you have suspended at least three members of the party, electoral area coordinators, and then um, polling station secretaries, and whatnot, for also standing up to campaign for Honorable Alan Martin. What about his, his, um, his deputy, Obri Boy, who said he's going to leave the hand of, so, uh, what they call it, a Mampusi person to win the, the what they call it, the, the flambership. All those who we have now been told are interested in standing for the election. Only one person is from Mampusi. If all of them were from Mampusi, I have no problem with your people. Only one of them is from Mampusi and is the vice president. Recently, another person too came and then castigated lies that, uh, what they call it, um, um, Honorable Alan Martin decided to, to quit the party when he lost to um, what he considered to um, uh, his sentence in Anakufad in 2007. The truth must be told. After Alan conceded and was hoping that the party should unite, 
people who were perceived to be supporters of Alan were being harassed by APP members. And Alan kept uh, 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 begging the, the, the national chairman to put this vote to order so that we come together, you see, come together as a family to win the 2008. That never happened. So Alan put up a conditional statement that if this is continuing, he cannot see the NDP losing the election. So it's because of him that certain people were being harassed. So he's going to step aside from the NDP so the NDP can win victory. It was conditional. And then it is being said that he, he did this and he, he decided to quit the party. It was conditional. Now, um, John Buedo is now asking Alan to distance himself from comments made by his alleged supporters. Well, we all know John Buedo to have advised the Greater Accra Regional Minister to hold on to his bid to get Accra neat, clean, and in order because it will harm our votes. A minister is doing his job to transform Accra. You are thinking about votes. Now here is this person who came who came out who came out to call Alan Tremontin to order, but has failed to call a, a Vice President Baumia to order for his alleged supporters who stormed the 2021 conference grounds in Kumasi. You see. We are having a repeat of what I said, the failed UGCC. And I must say something that I have no problem with that fine gentleman, uh, uh, what is called, Araji Baumia. The fact is that for the way things are going, people are beginning to speak ill of him, which shouldn't have been the case. He's a fine gentleman. But then, because of the party hierarchy who have surrounded him and, and, and probably, allegedly, pushing people on to support him openly, but pressing down people and punishing them for supporting other candidates, like Alan Chamartin, like Aputu um, Efriye, uh, like Bwachia Jaku, like Apreku, uh, like Jogate and Ho people will begin to feel that the vice president is using his office of, the, of his office to make sure that security agents go after these people. And you are doing harm to him. And one thing to leave his father out of this. Nobody should mention his father. I'm saying this because um, in the NDP, there are people who, who, who came over from the NDC. I can mention Boniface today. I can mention Rashid Bawa. I can mention Francis Essien. Now, these people are doing great work in the party. We are not looking at their background. But immediately, you are doing these sort of things and promoting his father, who, incidentally, when he joined the MPP from the, when he joined the CPP from the Northern People's Party, started attacking, uh, what do you call it, the UP uh, leaders. Okay. To the extent that he even went to, to, to say that um, the French government paid one million pounds to Dr. Busia to say the coup. Just to mention and the father, because you say that will muddy the water. So let's stick with the issues now. Let's not All go right. back to what his father did. All right. Thank you very much. I'm sorry, and I apologize to um, Baumia for mentioning his father in this. Go ahead. But I'm saying nobody should mention his father, or else people will bring out history mm. to destroy him. Okay. This is what I want to see. All right. To let see. me let me bring in Eric Osse. Eric Osse, okay, what would you. you describe as a, a satisfactory behavior or conduct of the NPP executives? Is Eric on? Yes, I'm on. Eric, I'm saying that what would make you uh, satisfied as a member of the party? Uh, I mean, what kind of conduct are you expecting from your executives? that will make you satisfied. Right, thank you very much. I hope you can hear me now. Loud and clear. Sure, a lot has already been said with respect to the reality on the ground. So I wouldn't go back 
to retreat what the earlier speakers have said. But I am coming from a background. In 2020, some of us wanted to contest on the ticket uh, on, of NPP during primaries. I'm a long-standing member of the NPP. I've been a polling station executive for the past 14 years. I've been a regional communicator. I founded Unemployed Graduates Association. I founded Ghana Youth Watch, which campaigned in all the 10 regions of Ghana for the NPP and His Excellency Nana Redanko Ekufuado. I'm a young man, but I could use my money to do all these things for the party, just for the love of the party. I come from a, a particular tradition like uh, Mr. Dugan said, where my background is purely NPP, and I've been trained to be an NPP, and I've come to understand the ideals and principles of the party, and I've, I'm convinced within myself to follow the NPP. But unfortunately, when in 2020 I wanted to contest, there were lots of, let me say, mafia works, uh, I mean, undertaken by this current crop of national executives. I will, I will say that because I know regional executives works under national executives. There are instances where one person can buy four nomination forms, parliamentary nomination forms. One person. In my constituency, two people bought four forms because they felt Ima is a threat because Ima is very much uh, in tune with the young people within the constituency. So I wasn't given the opportunity to contest. That aside, there are lots of constituencies where uh, certain MPs were protected through fair or foul means to go unopposed and the lies. At the end of the day, when I look back and saw that the plight of my people is that of a miserable one, and so the constitution of Ghana gives rise to the fact that I, I can contest independent. I decided to go. I went independent, had over 20,000 votes. The NPP candidate I contested, who is a minister, whose mother is a, a council of state member with all state apparatus supporting them. He also had 20,000, just as I had. Just that he had a little over 20,000 to beat me to it. But what I'm saying is, sitting back and seeing what I was taking through when I wanted to contest primaries, and also observing that this is the same mafia where that they want, some, some group of people want to met on other presidential aspirants. I said, no, the party belongs to our forefathers. They sacrificed their life to bring the party into existence. You won't sit down and allow anybody to take it as a personal property and use it any way he or she likes. Mm. So I also formed this Ashanti Patriots movement to, uh, to, to represent as a voice for the young people within this country. Okay. We won't sit down for people. You see, once it continues like that, it means you have to belong to a particular sect to mm. be able to, I mean, uh, have what it takes to do something to the benefit of the party. What so exactly, it is what, what exactly do you want? What, do, what exactly do you want from the executives? What we want is for the ideals of the new patriotic party, uh, to be brought to bear, equality. If anybody who flouts um, any of the rules that the National Council through the General Secretary brought on 27 July, let us see to how best we can apply the rules on everybody. Not that the uh, three guys from the Northern region are light-weighted so we can just flash them off the system and some grown-ups, some MPs, some what have you, have equally violated similar rules, but they can be left to go. That is what I am against. Let us do away with that. John Boydou, in his response to my press uh, statement, said, I went independent, and so I'm not a part. I, you see, I, I get marveled. In the 21st century, in a time like this, that knowledge is in abundance. Somebody who wants to break the eight, it is incumbent on you to uh, strategize in such a way that you can even get NBC members to fall for the MPP and vote for us. How much more... MPP members who went independent because of your, uh, your, your selfishness, greed, and what have you. It is for your inactions that there were lots of independent. They should even feel bad that under the Atena, in the history of Ghana, there hasn't been a time where independent candidates have been that many. It is under the Atena. And speaking against independent, I, I would like to even ask him, do we have majority in parliament? It's not an independent who is trying to give us majority. So how can you speak against independent? One year after elections, you don't see any need to bring together all independent candidates for us to see how best we can unite and rally all our supporters. Like I said, I had over 20,000 votes. Mm. Anybody, I'm not the only person who is forfeiting my uh, membership mm. because the, 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 the constitution says, if you say I forfeited my membership so I should step aside, it means you also step all my 
supporters are also stepping aside. Okay. How can you break the eight if you, if you go with this posture? Okay. It is as if they don't even understand what politics in this uh, contemporary times is about. Okay. Why I, here? I, I, we should have brought everybody on board and see how best. Right. I must be. say but, that we invited John Boydou, who is a general secretary, who has been accused of a number of things. He earlier agreed to be part of this conversation, but later pulled out. Um, I, I do not know his reason for pulling out, but... Um, uh, it's not a new thing in the MPP or any other political party that many people put themselves up for presidential candidate position. I mean, what is confusing right now is accusations of party executives favoring one side. We had Sam in the lead up to the 2020 elections and that angered a lot of members who ended up voting skirt and blouse and exactly what Eric has alluded to. Called the, the name party, is Emmanuel. Uh, Emmanuel, okay, Sagen. Emmanuel. Emmanuel so, could the party man have managed this any better, uh, Dr. Asante? Um, when you look at uh, the turn of events, I have no doubt in my mind that MPP has a big, big, big problem. You see, Nkrumah said, and I quote him there, that organization decides everything. Uh, within the party, they are not organized. We have to uh, say it bluntly. Yes, because if they are organized, then we want to see a uh, rule of law upheld. You see, democracy is anchored on the principle of rule of law, which has two components, equality before the law and due process. That everybody within the party is equal before the laws of the party. So if you begin to favor one group against the other, I'm afraid you are undermining internal democracy and even the democracy of the country itself. Due process, whatever decision you take within the party must resonate with the rules of the, the entire country. Is that what we are experiencing here? So it ties in uh, with the earlier position that they are not organized. They have a difficulty in organizing themselves. But there is something that they must take into consideration, that when we are talking about democracy, you should not put all your efforts on, you know, affirming the, the majoritarian minor a minority, uh, you know, divide. No. In a democracy, much as you want to support majority decision, you must not be oblivious of the fact that there is minority interest. So uh, somebody want to contest, it doesn't matter how uh, very few supporters that he has, uh, you must, you know, bring everybody on board and then you create that enabling environment that creates what equal platform for everybody. If people begin to all feel that they are not important within the party, then they begin to undermine the structures of the party. Uh, I can also see manipulation and deception, and uh, that is also a worrying sign, because this is a party that want to uh, maintain power after uh, two tenure, and uh, they need to rise above these things by you know manipulating the process to favor a particular candidate. Create that environment that it will be free for all to work contest. Whoever wins, he wins. And you, you all rally behind the person. But that's not what we also uh, forget the fact that, look, for you to be able to contest election and win massively in this country, it depends upon the work that you have done. It is uh, very, very important for them to know that, that if you don't have any record, any work that you have done that you can show, I'm afraid people are going to vote against you. Uh, even now, we are hearing a lot from the system that we haven't seen much from Nana Kufado's government. And uh, that is something that should occupy their attention so that whether it is true or not, at the end of the day, they must prove their metal and tell the public that, yes, this is what we have and we can show to the world. If they want to turn a blind eye on these things, I'm afraid we are going to have more tsunami uh, you know, shipping them away during the 2020 election. Uh, they need to also make sure that the party that they have voted, the country has voted for, and the government that is in power, you need to work and support the party. And then if you have any interest, you begin to what, manage it in such a way that it doesn't affect the government in power. Otherwise, what they are doing will be an exercise in futility. I want to be blunt to them. Mm. Dr. Ali said, what must give for sanity to prevail? Dr. Ali said, yes, I think what must happen, first of all, 
is for the national executives of the party to seriously consider and investigate these claims and allegations that have been made across the, the country about uh, the level of unfairness in the one up to the Fatih flag membership. We should not just dismiss them because when you have accumulated grievances, snowballing from the grassroots level to the national level, it is going to be a serious disaster for the party. And that would definitely not undermine internal unity and strength and cohesion, but it is going to make the party unattractive to the floating voters across the country. And we all know that the NPP alone cannot win elections by having just their supporters voting for them. You need the support of the floating voters and you need to some extent the support of some members of the NDC that you are able to convince. But if the house can, if the party cannot maintain its own internal democratic processes and unity and fairness, then it becomes very difficult for them to, to bring other people on board. So I think as a matter of agency, the national executives of the party should seriously look into the allegations that are being made and find a way to address them so that they can move forward as a united party rather than just dismiss them and say things that will even infuriate those who have genuine grievances and cannot even complain in the party. I think this should be taken seriously. And as a matter of fact, a committee must be set up to investigate these complaints and find a way to address them moving forward. Dr. Kobe Mensa, this bickering and seeming disunity certainly does not augur well for political communication as well as selling the party as the better option for the people. How dangerous or otherwise is this for the party's fortunes come 2024? Absolutely. I mean, if you cannot put your house together, uh, if you cannot make sure that you can maintain uh, law and order in your own party, how could you actually talk about, you know, uh, kind of moving forward a country uh, which is in dire need economically, socially. So I think that it talks about the capacity in terms of leadership that the MPP has in order to lead this country. I mean, I'm, I'm sure that quite a lot of people are already disappointed. And as, as uh, you know, uh, my friend Asasante actually pointed out, I don't think majority of people are actually convinced that the MPP leadership currently has actually delivered. I don't think that the Nado's administration has delivered. That's one conversation. And then, of course, to add up to a conversation that internally your support base is in a bickering position, and that is actually spilling over to the entire country. That talks about your competence in terms of leadership. For me, I think that also the Constitution is failing. We see continuous failure of our Constitution. And I think the leadership in this country must start addressing themselves to this issue. Remember, we had President Rawlings and Akai incident where President Rawlings you know, wanted to eject Aka, but he couldn't because Aka was on the ticket as a, what do you call, a, 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 what do you call, the Rawlings and the Aka ticket. And as a result, he couldn't actually dispatch him. Now, if indeed we had a, a, a story, a rumor that Nanado had given ultimatum to those who have actually come out to say they're contestant six months, is it six months? To June to actually resign their position. What about the vice president? The vice president is on the ticket with Nanado. Now, the president cannot ask the vice president to resign because per constitution he was voted for. But that is an injustice here because if those who are actually, you know, uh, pitching themselves for elections, you know, should resign, which I agree because obviously you're going to have parallel structure. So definitely it will be in the interest of the administration to say, look, you either work for governance to continue, or if you want to actually fight for leadership, then you have to leave. I agree perfectly. But it becomes injustice because you cannot ask the vice president to actually resign equally as you're asking the others to resign, which means that there's a constitution failure. So in the first instance where Rollins had issues with Akai, he couldn't sack. In this instance, of course, it seems to be that the president is actually perhaps, I don't know, but behind the, uh, the vice president may not be able to ask him because there's a constitutional provision that you cannot actually ask him to resign. And it means that we have an issue with our constitution. We have to actually have something to do with it. If a vice president midterm want to contest for leadership, which will be something that will be in, a, in conflict position with governance. And then of course it will give him an undue advantage. What does the constitution say? Must we be able to say that in that case, if you have an interest, 
you have to eject the government and you have to go and do your you know, party political, you know, uh, uh, what do you call contest, or do we still keep you? We have to have those conversations. So definitely what is happening is telling a lot of voters that we have lost leadership. You know, we are not seeing the kind of leadership that now those administrations that will provide the country because there's so much bickering in the governing party and there seem not to be any way of resolving it. At least the leadership of that party is not showing competence, it's not showing metal that they can deal with internal wranglings, let alone to deal with the issues that are going on in the country. Very, very you know, serious issues that we must consider. And Dr. Sassante, exactly what do you expect from the executives going forward? I believe that the executive must do self-introspection and see uh, to chart a clean path that people will begin to have what? A renewed confidence within the party. And also the council of elders must wake up and rise up to the occasion. What, what are they doing? Because they can't sit down for people to disobey the rules that really uh, govern the whole political structure and then without calling people to order. They, that is the highest body within the party that can you know, call people to order and speak uh, to them in a manner that will really save uh, the image of the party. So I believe that all these things must be taken seriously. In addition to this, uh, the party must know that it is important for them to put their house in order. Otherwise, from political communication perspective, all these things they are doing, uh, political communication scholars are picking bits and pieces, developing messages that will be churned against them during the electoral campaign. They must be very careful about this if they will really want to break the eight. And you cannot just say you want to break the eight without working. They need to leave a legacy, a legacy that they can stand on and campaign. If they don't have that, then it's going to be a tall order for them, so to speak. M Mr. Dugan, your colleague George Asante Corbia is asking for unity in the party with renewed hope, uh, renewed redirection to actually break the eight. For you, what will be satisfactory as a member of the party in terms of bringing everybody along to win power in 2024? Mr. Dugan, kindly unmute for me. Can you hear me now? Loud and clear. Thank you very much. Um, the only way for the NPP to break the eight is what my, my brother colleague just said. We need to come together. We need to move together. Everybody must be confident that Congress would elect someone who majority of the party loves, uh, like to lead the party into 2024. So that if let's say I support a free Akuto, uh, sorry, Akuto a free, and um, any other person wins, I shouldn't be bothered. I should rather be happy that the party has got a winner. And Nobody should be maligned, nobody should be ill-treated, nobody should be harassed for taking a certain position. Because you see, um, I keep on asking this question. If let's say you are asked to choose between your father and your mother, who will you choose and for what reason will you choose that person? When you choose your father over your mother, it doesn't mean you hate your mother. When you choose your mother over your father, it doesn't mean you hate your father. But based on certain reasons, you decide that I'm choosing daddy or I'm choosing mommy. So anybody who supports any of the candidates should not be seen to be an enemy of the party. But unfortunately, that is what we have been educated by the national executive to, to believe. You see, and this cannot make us break the eight because what happened, my brother uh, Samuel, said something, what happened? The position of, um, of, uh, of uh, MPs on us or using powers to make sure that certain people do not win the primaries was what caused us. I can say that in the constituency I reside in, a, uh, what do you call it? Our candidate lost, not because the NDC are voted, but the MPP rather voted against. 
because they weren't happy about the arrangements from, from head office, from national headquarters, and then from regional headquarters. So if you want to break the eight and set the record as the first political party to, to, to win three straight victories at the election, then we must come together. And, I, and this is the suggestion I'm going to make to the national executive. That is it, don't take it. Whatever the beautiful uh, code of conduct that, that they wrote, very beautiful code of conduct that they wrote, they themselves are not applying the code of conduct, um, 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 what they call it, genuinely. Let's put this in aside. Now let's say that, okay, you can campaign for any candidate of your choice, but do not, do not insult, do not castigate, do not say bad words against the candidate you don't support. This is going to help because whatever thing comes out from your mouth against that candidate, if that candidate is to win the primaries, the opposition will have enough ammunition to throw at him. Well, your party people said this, your party people said that. So that one, they should uh, forego it. And I'll play with John Boydou to either come out clean, come out clean, or he should just keep quiet like the national chairman himself, they are not hearing his voice, to keep quiet, but well behind the scenes, to rather unite the party than dividing the party, as it seems he is doing now. Mm. Dr. Kobe Mensah, what should be the strategy? Because at the end of the day, the NPP wants to put itself up for a win and not to fail. I want to believe that. Yeah, I think that uh, just like uh, Mr. Dugan actually you know, talked about, I think there must be a meeting between the interested stakeholders, you know, because uh, clearly this is getting, you know, uh, uh, what do you call, uh, overboard. It's actually uh, uh, escalating. I think, firstly, the, the party executive must call the stakeholders and then, you know, perhaps put out a very, you know, clear message of, you know, decency. How do you ensure that you can actually go about your campaign without necessarily causing you know, damage, you know, reputational damage to the political party in case one of them wins. So once you, you actually call for that truce, you call for that engagement, you put the rules you know, you know, on the table, and then you make sure that people would come to terms that, yes, the rules will be applied equally. I am sure people would actually respect that. And as some of my colleagues have already said, I think the national executives plus uh, what we call the Council of Elders must also come together to sort of come out with the rules and regulations that will be favorable to everybody else. Because currently, as it's going, the bickering that's going on is not helping them at all uh, because it's actually denigrating their image as due process, their image as the party that is the most organized, which they always tout themselves as such. Suddenly, it's not going down that way. Now, the president must be clear, you know, on his stance. Now, clearly, he cannot do anything to the vice president if he actually campaigns because the constitution, you know, says so. You cannot actually push the vice president out. But I think that when people hear you say, you know, for those who have expressed interest, uh, they must resign, and that rule does not apply to the vice president, people who do not understand the constitutionality of it is going to actually question the fairness of that. And I, I think that has to be communicated because people wouldn't actually take it lightly that why would you ask these people to resign but not the vice president? That communication must be clear so that people would understand it's a constitutional issue but not a deliberation by the, by the president. But I think the key strategy is to call for truth. I think the party organs the stakeholders in terms of the, you know, the, uh, uh, the Council of Elders, the national uh, executives, the various interest groups in terms of the candidate who want to contest must come together to pull together a very, you know, formalized, a very structured rules and regulations that actually favors almost everybody and then push it together. That would bring some kind of unity. And as Mr. Dugan said, if everyone sees that the rules are being applied you know, clearly and fairly. I think that it wouldn't be difficult to bring the party together post the leadership contest, regardless of who wins or who loses. But if you do not do that, that is where you have a problem where the party is likely to be split and you're going to have an issue on your hand 
going into the 2024 elections. Mm. Dr. Ali said, do you call for a committee to uh, ascertain the truth in all the allegations that is being made against the executives? How urgent is this? I mean, how early should this happen? Is Dr. Ali to say today? I think Ali is not on the call. Oh, okay. So we lost Dr. Ali Dusedo. I would like to throw that to you, Dr. Sasanti, then. How early should this happen? Can you unmute for me, Dr. Sasanti? Yeah. I think time is not on the side of the NPP. They need to work and work very fast and make sure that uh, they get all these uh, problems addressed quickly. Quickly, they need to do that. And I also see that there is a problem with their institutions. You know, now it appears to me that the institutions that they have built that has really stood the test of time is crumbling. They need to work on their institution. By institution, I'm talking about the procedures, the processes, the norms, the rules, and all that. They need to make sure that these things work and work. Well. And how do you make them work? You need to enforce the rule rigidly without fear, without favor, you know. Uh, that is very, very critical. And they should also not push the party uh, to the position that, where people can describe it as electoral machinery. That, yes, you are not thinking about how to govern the state and provide the needs of the people who uh, really give them their mandate in 2000 and uh, 2020. But they should be able to what? Work and support the people so that out of that, the people can also re reciprocate by giving them what? Their mandate come 2024 20, elections. But if they want to turn it into electoral machinery, I'm afraid they are going to destroy the party tradition in no time because then people will not trust them. They will believe that as for these people, they only want power. One day the power, every time you put them into office, they just work for power, power, power. They will not fight for the ordinary man in the city. And that will have a boomerang effect in their political fortunes. Mm. I'm grateful for your time. Uh, Dr. Asas Sante is political science lecturer in uh, the Department of Political Science at the University of Ghana. And he's also director of the Center for European Studies. Christian Daniel Dugan is former deputy minister for fisheries and the Kufo administration. And uh, Dr. Kobi Mensa is political communication strategist with the University of Ghana Business School. And Dr. Ali Duseidu also joined us. He's senior lecturer at the Department of Political Science uh, at the University of Ghana. And Emmanuel Osei, also a member of the NPP. And... Uh, um, convener for the Asante Patriots movement. I'm extremely grateful that all of you joined the conversation. Let's take a break on the polls. We'll bring you more on this. Welcome back to the Pulse to the rest of our stories. The Attorney General's office has vowed to produce evidence that will show beyond reasonable doubt that minority spokesperson Kessie Latoforsen caused a 2.5 million euros loss to the state. This has to do with the procurement of ambulances, which are said to be unfit for purpose. Court correspondent Joseph Akable was in court when Mr. Forsen pleaded not guilty to the charges. The Attorney General's office on Tuesday responded to allegations that its prosecution of Dr. Atuforsen is politically motivated. Alfred Tuayabua is a Deputy Attorney General. We come to court with evidence. The matter has just started. We are going to lead evidence in court. At the end of the day, the evidence will show that this case is not a case where we are trying to use any other means to weaken their, their, their strength. Nothing of that sort. Pure legal matters and nothing. We are dealing with what we have through the investigations conducted by the Ghana Police Service and Iyoko. So based on what we have, we think these are the appropriate people to be brought before this court. This one is a fake ambulance scandal and we are ready anytime to appear before the courts and put across our case. 
Dr. Forsen himself had the opportunity to respond to the charges leveled against him. He pleaded not guilty as he was granted a self recognizance bill. The other two accused persons were also granted bills with sureties in the sum of 2 million and 5 million CDs, respectively. A Felix Kwachiofos, who served in government with a Dr. Forsen, insists that the case is politically motivated. Mr. Kwachiofos, we spoke to the AG's office a short while ago. I mean, yesterday we heard from one of your leaders in parliament who believes that uh, this is an attempt to weaken your front. But the AG's office, they've responded, they say that it's the evidence that he's speaking and that's why they are in court. I mean, you served in, in government with Mr. Forsen. What do you make of what you heard in court today about the facts? Well, if, if the evidence indeed spoke, <laughs> the AG would not be in court. Because we are clear in our minds that everything done around the subject matter of the purchase of the 200 ambulances was above board. It was done in compliance with the laws and regulations of the Republic of Ghana. The necessary approvals and authorizations were sought. Uh, no payment was done irregularly. As far as we are concerned, no loss has been occasioned to the state of Ghana. The Attorney General's office has been given up until 8 February 2022 to make the necessary disclosures, i.e. to make available to the court documents they intend to use as evidence against the accused persons. Uh, the trial continues on 14th of February 2022. For joining us on the Law Court Complex, my name is Joseph Akable. And here in Kokum Limley in the studio, my name is Aisha Ibrahim. We'll take a break on the polls. When we return, we'll bring you all the updates in spot. Time now for sports and the Ghana Black Stars currently sit third on the Group C table after a loss to Morocco and draw against Gabon. Well, the senior national team seeking their first win of the tournament in order to give them an opportunity to qualify to the next phase of the competition. There have been so many discussion points ahead of Comoros encounter later tonight. Joining me in the studio is Joy Sports analyst Joel Botte and football coach Nana Jiman, who is also be joining us via Zoom, and former Black Stars player Sam Johnson. He joins us via uh, phone. Uh, let me start from the studio, uh, Joel. So Ghana now has, what, one point mm -hmm. in, in Group C. Yeah. So what does this mean? I mean, what do we have to do to get to the next phase of the competition? So in terms of Ghana's qualification, we need a win against Comoros okay. to even start with. Mm. And we also need Gabon to lose to Morocco, Morocco later today. Okay. We also need that to give us a three-goal margin that is between the two games. We need a three-goal margin mm. in order to get qualification. Mm. And we are looking to get that via the second place. Okay. If Gabon lose and we are able to win and we have a three-goal uh, goal difference, mm. then that will guarantee us a second place to qualify. Mm. However, there's a third place seating also as well where the best third place team can also qualify. Okay. But that will be dependent on groups D and E as well which is a little bit complicated to, to explain. So first, we need to target the win, and we also need a three-goal goal difference. Mm. The, the lineup has been a matter of discussion, and uh, there's been a lot of uh, you know, back and forth on whether the lineup will change or not. What are we getting from the, the camp of uh, Ghana? So from the camp of Ghana, currently, we are hearing news about Fatao Isahaku, the young 17-year-old, getting a starting place today. Or possibly we could see a 4-4-2 formation being deployed this time. I, mean, I think Milo is trying to change things up, especially because of how things went in the first two games. And as a result of that, that is why he's looking to bring in speed tests at the wide areas. That is either Kamal Dean and, and um, Fatao or mm. Joseph Penso and, and Fatao. Okay. We're looking to see how that will go. Mm. Mm. After losing uh, uh, two matches, uh, a lot of people have, the, the confidence has derailed, not to waste about that. Nana Ajiman, are you confident that Ghana can get the job done against Comoros tonight? Nana Ajiman. Oh, thank you very much. Um, yes, I'm here. Well, it looks as if I'm frozen. <laughs> All right, so I'm asking if you're confident that we can be able to beat Comoros at Owet tonight. 
Well, to be honest with you, I, I just don't know. I've got to be honest with you. If I said I was confident, I wouldn't be telling you the truth, Aisha. Um, the, the truth of the matter is I'm worried. Um, because as, as your analyst is describing for you in the studio, the ways that we could qualify are indeed very complicated and in some instances are dependent on other results as well. Naturally, the first thing we must think about is the win. And secondly to that is we must score as many unanswered goals as possible, ideally. Whether or not we can do that, I don't, I really don't know. We've got a coach who we know, his principle, his philosophy is born out of scoring one goal and leaving it at that. Uh, yes, it would give us the three points, but there may be a huge challenge when it comes down to goals scored and, and goals conceded. I don't really know. It's a tough task. I would love them to come through, um, but I just, I, I just really don't have an idea. They've, they've lost one. They've drawn a match they should never have drawn. Uh, this could have been in the bag already, um, but that's the way the cookie crumbles at the moment. Now, let, let me bring in Sam Johnson. I mean, you, you have been here before, and there's been a lot of complaining about the kind of formation we're playing. You've been there before. What is wrong with us? No, like, I think uh, I'm very uh, happy the way uh, Coach said, Nana said, it's very, very important. What we are doing now, there, nobody knows what is going on there because uh, me personally, on the field, uh, I, I really don't know, apart from maybe putting our players to our various positions that everybody see the system that we play, 4-3-3, uh, three, three. apart from this, that system that we see, I don't know how we play, how we, 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 we defend, I, I really don't know. So when you ask me about the system or what it is, to tell you, because I don't believe in, in the system that we are playing now. I hope and pray that today, he will learn his lesson from these two games so that we will do something better for our nation. Because uh, you don't see the agency in the guys that they want to do something for themselves. Sometimes when the coaches are, are confused, that is where the player, you show the caliber of player that you are. And we don't see that in them now. And it makes everybody confused. Like my senior man said, <laughs> we, we've been singing the same song every time. Oh, the, the, the things will be okay, things will be okay. And things are getting worse. Somebody who can defend one goal in, in 10 years ago, he can defend this one goal very, very good. This is the time that we need the one goal most. He can defend that goal. So you, 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 I, 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 I don't think we can put our, our full... I, I mean, personally, I can put my full trust in them. But hi, what can we do? They are there. We have to support them in any way so that we give them that morale. But me personally, uh, I'm not sure, but I hope and pray that things will change today. I I'm so happy that Milo himself admits that the team we had in 2010 is not the same that we have now. What's the difference between the team we had in 2010 and what we have now? He's supposed to be the last person to say that, but of course, if when you're trying to hide behind uh, the curtains, this is what will happen. You know that this team is the same, but you promise us to bring the cup. You know, so well, now the things are difficult. Now you are telling us that 10 years ago, the team is different. Of course, you don't have a Samoan, you don't have Steven Apia, you don't have Mutsule Mintare. So you can't be proud. This is the time you have to show us that you know better. This is the time you have to show us that you know better. Because at that time, what we have, any coach who has a little bit intelligent can do something with the team. But now you have to show your, your capacity, how you good you are. This is the time. And if you can't make it with that and you are telling that 10 years ago you don't have that squad, then what are you telling us? Are we not, are, are, uh, those over there, are they not the, uh, talented? Are they not good ones? Who call them? You do the, 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 the caller. So what are you telling us now? But all the same, <laughs> we are in. So we just hope that they will, they will, they will do. But sometimes... Even if you don't play good, uh, good football, you have to, on the field, people must see how serious, how tough, you, how, how 
agents you want to win the game, you know. All these things matter. And let me tell you this story for, for a short time. Against uh, Ivory Coast, 2006, we said we're not going to lose this game because if we lose this game again, that means we are going to lose from, the, from uh, 92, 94, and 96. It's not going to happen. If we win this game and we come out from uh, South Africa, we are okay. And we make sure, everybody makes sure that we win this game. Are they going to put on the same character today? If they did, there is no way. There is no way we will come out, even draw, or maybe one or two or three. We, maybe we can score maybe three or four goals if they go in with this kind of character. Nanajiman, I can see you, you actually are actually passionate about um, responding to this particular one. I mean, how would you describe the team we had in 2010 then and the team we have now? Uh, um, let, me cut, let me cut the cake from a different angle. Sam Johnson is absolutely right. There's no way a coach should be saying this now or any time. You know, just think about the players that have heard this. You know, he's their coach. He's the one they're looking up to. He's their leader. And he's come back to tell Garnes that, you know, quite frankly, the team that I have is not really a good team. And even when I compare it to what I had before, they're nowhere near there. And I haven't come here with any strikers. That's what he said, because there's no Hassan or Jack. So the players he's picked to strike, they're not strikers. They're not strikers. And I've already always maintained he's traveled there with only one striker. And that's the local lad from the Olympics team. Everyone else that has been labeled a striker are not actually strikers. But... You know, the thing about it is when you look at 2010, you look at the, you know, the team that we had representing us in the first World Cup that we, we featured in in 2006. There's not one player that can match the capacity, the ability, the skill of any of those players at all that are in this team currently. Not one. It's not just a matter of Asamoja. There's lots of players there. We even had Kingston, he was there. You've got the Payne still. You, you, you know, you've got the, the uh, Addis. You've got the entire midfield quartet. That was Lyle Kingston. Unfortunately, he didn't go to the World Cup. He, he lost the plot. But there was Lyle Kingston, Suleiman Tari, Stephen Napier, and Michael Essien. That was one of the best midfield quartets in the world at the time. In the world. Let me tell you. And, and then with Asamoah up front, eventually we had um, um, uh, Kujo Asamoah joining us as well. He was also fantastic. There's, there's no one in this team that matches the caliber of what we had in 2010. No one. Not that it can't happen, but we haven't spent the time to work with the players and to nurture them and to build them in a way in which we did before. Because the majority of those players, uh, especially the Montaris and Sullis, they all came from Colts. They all came from Colts football. And Colts has only just been revived last year. Only just. And still yet, we don't hear anything about Colts like we did back in the day. I used to go and watch Colts matches. Most people used to go and watch Colts matches. People don't really go now even though it's just been revived. So, you know, what worries me is that, is that the, the players would have heard what the coach has said. And to many of them, it might be quite demoralizing for the person they are looking up to who is leading them to tell the rest of the world that these boys ain't quality. It must be very demoralizing. Yes, I know they want to prove a point, no doubt about that, but... I don't think it's the, the right thing that should have been said, even though it is 100 percent true. Hmm. Um, um, Joel, I mean, the last time we're talking about the people who make up the lineup, and uh, rightly so, uh, Ms. Ajiman is also uh, making that point. He says the team we have now is nowhere comparable to the one we had in 2010. But there's this name that has come up strongly, Jordan Ayu. I mean, a lot of complaints about him and the fact that the coach is still keeping Jordan Ayu there when he's actually not doing anything for us. 
Well, just as um, the Nanji man said, we have only one striker in the name of uh, Abagna. And we know that we need Jordan to step up as uh, an experienced player who has played at a striking role mm -hmm. and has played as an inside forward as well. Yeah. That's off the wings. Mm. We are expecting Jordan to step up because we know he has that competence to score goals. But unfortunately, we are not seeing that. Hence why the complaints are coming up. And you know, when you don't have the confidence and all of that, sometimes fans will react and say they need someone to take your place. Okay. But then is this the time to let someone take Jordan's place? That's the question. Because if you look at the last two games, he's had only one shot and that shot was off target. Mm -hmm. The game against Morocco, no shots. And the game against Gabon, one shot and it was off target. Mm -hmm. That is quite poor for, for someone you expect to take, take up that, that role of, of a striker. So, well, I don't know about him leading a line today, but we hope that if he does, he steps up this time. Mm. Uh, are there any likely opponents I mean, designed I mean, for us, should we qualify? So, should Ghana qualify... It depends on where we qualify through. If we qualify our second place in Group C, we could play Burkina Faso. Okay. But if we qualify as third place, we could play Cameroon, the host nation, because they top their group. Mm. So that's where we are. That's the lines we find ourselves. So uh, Burkina and uh, Cameroon. Cameroon. Cameroon especially. That's if we qualify through third place. What are our chances with these two people? Our chances are quite slim because if you've looked at our performance over these past two games, they've not been encouraging. Mm. Even the game that we thought should have been won against Gabon, we didn't step up. Yep. How about playing these two sides that are, have done well in their group? Mm -hmm. can, we, can we match the level and mm -hmm. intensity they are playing? Mm -hmm. That's a question. Mm. So we, we would have to ask ourselves a lot of, of ifs if you are looking to play these teams. Mm. Sam Johnson, I mean, what do you want to see tonight when Ghana meets their compatriots from Comoros? To, to, today what I want to see is the commitment and full concentration and... I, I want to see fighters on the field, fighters. If they fight and they can't make it, we know that they fight today and they can't. They fought today and they can't make it. But if they play the same as they are doing, I don't think anybody will be happy with them. So I see that uh, today they have to commit themselves that they are defending the flag of Ghana. And I, I, I hope they will, they, will, they will come out. So, so the, the last time they were meeting uh, Morocco, the um, advice was for Ghana to do a lot more of the defense. Um, unfortunately, we didn't see that. Um, with Gabon, did it happen? With Gabon, well, what happened was we took our only chance of the game, but we didn't hold on. We didn't show that fighting spirit because Gabon were looking for a result. Mm. They weren't yeah. looking for necessarily a win. But if it was a draw, they were satisfied. So we okay. should have controlled the game a bit more. Mm. Yeah. That we didn't. Mm. So, so Sam John saying, what should we do? More defense, more attack? Or we should, we should show the fighting spirit, which uh, uh, Joel talks about? No, in this kind of game, it, we just, you just have to play attack. But not attack with uh, leaving your back to be. We have to play compact. If we play compact football. And I, I can give so many instances. You are defending together, you are attacking together. That is how it goes. You know, and we play compact. If we open ourselves like this and when the ball is... You, we always have to, have to make sure the ball is in front of us. All the players, the ball is in front of us. When it's even in our goal area, everybody is in front of the... I mean, the goal. When we are going, we all attack. We attack together, we come together. If we play compact, I think that will, that will help us so that we won't open ourselves for them to be easy, you know, passing the balls I mean, around us. Because you don't see us running and, you know, harassing the, 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 the opponent, opponents. We always, you know, go casual and you can play the ball anyhow. And doing that, if you go to a last place and you are pushing that pressure, you are selling yourself, you get tired early, and when you get tired, what will happen? You lose that energy to defend again, and it will cause us a very serious, I mean, uh, team. So we have to be careful and know how to go to attack and also how to defend. We, we don't have to sit. If we sit, we don't have that player that will do that job to, to, to go. So we have to open up and go in, but we make sure that we play 
come back as much as possible. Well, I, I, I hope that the Black Stars have ears to listen to these uh, pieces of advice being given to them by a former Black Stars player. But of course, um, thank you so much, uh, Joel, for uh, bringing us those updates. And thank you, Nana Ajeman. I know you are, you are not happy with the Black Stars, but do well to watch the match tonight. And there's only one advice I want to leave you with. Eat your food, eat your fufu, eat your banku. Eat very well before you watch that match, before they give you heartbreak. That's it for sports. And that's how we wrap up uh, the polls this afternoon. My name is Aisha Ryan. Many thanks for watching. Let's talk showbiz is up next. Enjoy the rest of our programs.